like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. All right. Dorothy Venable, BPA Reserve for Mr. Say. Uh, the trial court's attempt to rewrite the proposal for settlement that was served to Mr. Say in, in order to insert the terms and conditions that were not included in the first place was based on some erroneous understandings of Florida law. The fourth BCA has specifically said that the ability to pay is not a reason why a person cannot accept a proposal for settlement. So that proposals for settlement and offers of judgment are designed to terminate the litigation and to seek an end to the case. And the issue is not whether or not the person has the ability to pay, it's whether or not they're willing to accept the terms of the settlement. So in Alexander versus Meyer, the fourth BCA said, it's not about the ability to pay. This court agreed with Alexander versus Meyer in its Wagner versus Brandberry opinion. And in this particular case, the proposal for settlement had only one condition, and that was upon acceptance, then we'll dismiss. And Mr. Say is not in breach of that agreement until all of the terms of that agreement had been complied with, so that when the court found that he was in need of a compelling enforcement of the settlement, it was premature. There's no evidence to say that Mr. Say was in fact in breach of that agreement, that he didn't have the ability to pay, that he wasn't willing to pay. So what was the agreement? Let's, the, let's talk about the agreement. I agree. So the agreement was to settle the case, and that's all, for $200,000. That's all the terms of that agreement. Okay. And Mr. Say said, I'll take those terms. And the courts have said, when you look at a proposal for settlement that presents you with a dilemma, such as I ha am faced with a proposal for settlement that will force me to incur not only attorney's fees if I don't accept it, but potentially a larger verdict or a judgment if I don't accept it, then that is not a reason why it's an invalid proposal. So that the fact that a plaintiff can make a proposal to a settlement, a proposal of settlement to a defendant that is far in excess of the defendant's liability insurance and far in excess of what the plaintiff believes the defendant can actually pay, that does not render that proposal invalid. So if a plaintiff is free to make a proposal to someone that they don't think they can pay, then the defendants are free to accept those proposals even if they can't pay. But in this case, it was not an issue of whether or not somebody has the ability to pay, correct? It, that's truly not an issue. Okay. An issue the is we filed a notice of acceptance, and that was all that was asked for before this dismissal happened. And it appears that what the judge did made a conclusion that looking at this agreement, your, your client was taking the position, even though they received this offer uh, to settle, we'll accept, even though the terms include $200,000, the only issue it did not have when that payment needed to be made. That's right. And they're taking the argument that this form was taken right out of the rules and they followed it verbatim. And so that issue was brought before the court. And I think your client basically said, we accept and basically sat back and say, you know, you need to have the order, dis the, the order of dismissal. And as, I, and as I understand the facts, that plaintiff's counsel went ahead and mailed to defense counsel the actual notice of dismissal and basically asked to please hold that until they pay the amount. And that's, that's where this whole litigation started happening, correct? That is correct. Um, it, in fact, it's interesting because if you'll compare this case to the Economides case, where they expressly said that we will, upon acceptance, will dismiss. And the court said, and then they tried to argue that that was ambiguous because they couldn't accept that because they didn't know if after dismissal they would ever pay. And this court said, no, that doesn't make it ambiguous. That's just one of the consequences of a dr proposal that's drafted that way. So uh, using that case, what the court did here, basically found in the order, yes, there's been an agreement, and yes, ordered that the dismissal be entered, and then in that same order said, okay, since the agreement was the payment of 200000 the court then directed the time period for that amount to be paid. Why would that, why is that error in this case? Because there was no evidence that this, this settlement needed to be enforced at that point. And not only did they enforce it, so, that you okay, needed to so pay. Having, okay, so having said that, I'm trying to understand your position. So basically, it's the, the, it's the defense position. When can it be enforced? 
Um, and again, I think that the court went beyond just saying, I'm going to enforce it. Then the court said, and it has to be paid in 10 days. Okay, well, let's set aside that you okay. made a statement said, we accept it. Then the issue is like, when can it be enforced? And that's what I'm trying to follow. Oh, well, and I think the law, just generally speaking, the law of contracts implies reasonableness into contracts. So now we have a contract. And the contract is that we have a settlement. And if the payment has not come in a reasonable time, then I believe the plaintiff can come forward with a motion to enforce. So, and then right, there may if be a time, If a time for performance isn't specified, the law implies a reasonable time, exactly. correct? Correct. And there's no evidence here to show that 10, 10 days for a person who is apparently either in California or China can come up with $200,000 in 10 days. Now, with that, has that been brought to the court's attention below? Well, I think the transcript from the hearing went into that in some considerable detail. And in fact, the transcript, the hearing sort of started out with, we need a dismissal, and the court recognized that that's what they needed, and then it, it turned into, but Your Honor, you have to enforce this and start sanctioning this person because Geico's never gonna pay this, this proposal. No, but thankfully, the court did not go there. I know there was right. talking about sanctions and a certain monetary amount, but the question becomes, I guess for me, when it was debated, because the big debate is that I understood your client's position was, yeah, we agreed to, it, they're gonna dismiss it, and we have basically any time we could pay this. And somehow the insurance company got injected in this proceeding, which added another you know, uh, issue. And so the question becomes, the court, as I understand it, was basically exacerbated. And so uh, just what can we do? There's an agreement between the parties. There's an agreement as to this amount. And the judge took upon himself to set forth a time period for that. Exactly. And there's no authority for that in the settlement agreement that 10 days is the time it has to be paid. And to inject those kind of payment I mean, conditions. That's just I mean, out of thin air. Yes. And that is very specifically not something the courts can do into settlement agreements. Again, it, it well, you know, the, if I'm remembering correctly and understood this correctly, neither party has argued there's no settlement agreement. Well, it's interesting because in fact, in the answer Both brief- Both sides are asking for it to be enforced. In the answer brief, there's an implication by arguing it's a unilateral contract. Well, yeah, well, I, we'll, we'll get to that. But Mr. <laughs> but Mr. Brennan very specifically said, and I wanna say it was page 12, 14, 15, or somewhere around there on the transcript, he very specifically said that that is the worst thing this court can do is to find there is no settlement agreement. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, well. <laughs> But I'm glad Judge but, but Kelly, I just yeah. want to make sure I understand that nobody's arguing that there's no settlement agreement. Uh, we th believe that there's Everybody very clear. wants to get it enforced. Right. Okay, so what you have is an agreement that says we'll settle for 200000 Exactly. On acceptance, we'll dismiss it. Exactly. You said, okay, dismiss it. Exactly. And they said, well, wait. No, we're not dismissing it till you pay. But that's not one of the provisions of, of when you pay. Right. I mean, I think the agreement requires you to pay the 200000 but it doesn't say when. So it leaves you, well, a reasonable time. And then they can move to enforce it. I mean, is that your argument? Exactly. And then when they move to enforce, if they're going to file enforcement in the trial court the, the, where they, the proposal for settlement agreement is, they are limited to certain remedies there. And if they want to sue for damages for breach of the agreement, they need to go file a separate action. Okay, now help me. Either move within this action right. and ask the trial court to enforce the settlement agreement, correct? Correct. Or the other position is to file a separate action. Exactly. But didn't they do that in this case? I thought the, the final order that the court said, he handled the dismissal aspect, then went ahead and said, I hereby find that there'll be, I'm granting the motion to compel it, oh, yes, exactly. They moved to enforce the settlement when there had been no evidence that they needed to do that. And there okay. was no evidence that, that, in fact, Mr. Say was not going to pay in a reasonable time and that there was no understanding at all that Mr. Say was in breach of any, in any way. Well, there was no evidence presented on that, and yet the court went beyond just simply saying, here's the settlement agreement well, with these understandings. But, well, let, let's backtrack because what was presented to the court, in all fairness, was a lot of exchange that went back and forth between the, the attorneys. Right that we have an agreement, and everybody agrees, and I'm glad you put that issue to rest, because I was gonna ask that, but Judge Kelly asked the question, which is, which is great, that both sides agree that there is a settlement. So that 
issue is, is to the side. Then what happened in this case is that the party, the, the, the plaintiff, brought forth and said, okay, we want you, judge, to enter an order compelling this, the enforcement of this. And so, as I understand at the hearing, that the court saw and heard all back and forth, and it was the impression, your client was like, you know, I'm not gonna pay. I don't have to pay. It doesn't say when I'll pay. I'll pay whenever I think I'm gonna pay. And the other side was just flabbergasted, said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You need to pay. Are you taking the position that you could wait a year or two years or 10 years to pay, make that payment? So all that was brought before the court. So the court did, in fact, enter an order enforcing the agreement. But the thing that the judge did, and this is what I'm trying to understand, is that time period that the judge imposed. Well, and, and in fact, I, I think that the transcript reflects that Mr. Haas never once said Mr. Say was not going to pay. He repeatedly said Mr. Say might pay this, this judgment. I mean, a lot of times these decisions But if you look at the emails, I, I understand, yes. but if you look at the things, there was an implication there that hey, we'll pay whenever we think we're gonna pay. You, you didn't have the time period. A actually, we actually I think the understanding is, is that if I can't pay, there might be some other thing of value that you would be able to take in order to settle and accept this. It isn't that I, we don't think we have to or when we do, it's sometimes, it, it, the issue is, what is it that they really want? Is it in fact, if they can't get the 200,000, is there some other way to, to satisfy this contractual obligation? Much like, I'm sorry. Well, I, I just, I, I wanna clarify something. The, the, what they asked for, and correct me if I'm not remembering this properly, I believe what, what they asked for when they went into court to in, try to enforce the settlement was they asked the court to require payment prior to dismissal. That was what they requested. That's what they started with, yes. Okay, and so this whole notion of 10 days or whatever came up during the hearing, but what they sought, the remedy they sought to enforce the settlement agreement was, well, order them to pay before dismissal, whereas the settlement agreement just said, we'll dismiss upon acceptance. Exactly. And it didn't specify that you could only accept this by payment. Exactly. And, and again, I agree that there was so, some... Which, which if, the, if, 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 if acceptance, if, if you were required to pay, if it was a unilateral con contract that required payment prior to acceptance or pay, ex payment as acceptance, then you don't have a settlement agreement. That's the unilateral right? contract issue. If I haven't paid and that's the only way I can accept, then there is no I, I Honestly, I don't know how, how, how you have a settlement agreement here, but everybody seems to think you do, so. <laughs> I, I wanted to make sure that that issue is put to rest. So now Yeah, you, with... everyone thinks it's a settlement agreement, so well, and they and want to enforce it, but. Oh, and, and again, if, if in fact it doesn't get paid, then we can come back on a, a motion well, for. Well, th there's, there's remedies for that. Right, there are remedies that you know, can be properly sought if in fact Mr. Say does not fulfill his contractual obligation. And I think that was the point Mr. Haas was, make, was trying to make. And I, you know, I think Mr. Haas will agree that he's not as artful about it as an appellate lawyer might be, but he was trying to make the point that Mr. Say has taken this, he's agreed to this contract. And there's no evidence at all that Mr. Say is not going to fully live up to his contractual obligation. So let me ask you this, Mr. Haas. So the error in this case is the court imposing the 10 day yes. time period. Yes, and, and considering, all, I but mean, you don't started to go to a whole lot of other things, but he actually never no, got no, but, there. But so. um, we're looking at the order that's on appeal. I mean, this is the, the order that he has signed. And he basically signed an order saying that within 10 days you have to pay. And that's the issue that you're taking with. Well, the, the idea that he had to compel enforcement of this agreement. Okay, so what are you seeking? That, I, we, that we do what? that you vacate the order with it and remand for instructions to simply dismiss the case and proceed from there. Okay, proceed and do what? To see if Mr. Say is gonna live up to his contractual obligations and if not, the plaintiff has jurisdiction to come back and enforce it or to go file a separate action. So you reverse it, so in terms of when would your client be paying this amount? Well, we'd have to find out from my client with a, a proper evidentiary hearing as compared to the arguments of counsel who insist that this is some kind of man manufactured gamesmanship on the part of an insurance company who's not a party to this lawsuit. Of course, you have to wonder about what the gamesmanship is when he presents a proposal for settlement that he doesn't think the man can pay. And is it in fact just an attempt to set him up for attorney's fees on top of a judgment? 
And so where is the gamesmanship here? It just uh, We don't have evidence of Mr. Say's gamesmanship. We have flat out that evidence that Mr. Brennan served a proposal for settlement he See, didn't think anyone could uh, accept. But you know what, Mr. Crow, I mean, in reading that, I mean, both sides, it was just disturbing, quite frankly, because obviously both sides agree there's an agreement. Both sides never took issue with the settlement. And then both sides suddenly stood firm and one of them said, you can't make me pay. I mean, this is what it boiled down to with one side saying, you can't make me pay. And the other side saying, I will make you pay. And that's what it well, boils down to. Well, I, I don't think so because I don't think Mr. Say ever said, you can't make me pay. I think what Mr. Say is said, has said very clearly is, we're entitled to the dismissal. And if I don't pay after that, and if there's no other way to resolve this, then you can come in with an enforcement, there'll be a judgment, you can go get a writ of execution, you can go get a writ of garnishment, you can go do whatever you want. I believe in the, the third party debtors like Mrs. Catlett can become, bring an action directly against his liability insurer without an assignment from him or anything. So in other words, they can collect on that $200,000 settlement on, by a variety of means. So if he doesn't voluntarily write a check, they have a way of getting paid. So it's, it's not like he's saying, uh, you can't ever get your money. In fact, he's never said, I don't intend to pay. That's all a speculation on the part of everybody to this case because Mr. Say wanted to wait until he'd gotten the fulfillment of the plaintiff's side of the bargain before he started to do anything else. And in fact, if the court was going to say that apparently there's been no meeting of the minds because you guys are, can't see, see it clearly, then there is no contract, then Mr. Say doesn't want to write a check for $200,000. <laughs> so I, I think that's all I have unless there are more questions. Okay, and I'll Thank save you. some more time for maybe. Thank you. Good morning, may it please the court. My name is Joel Eaton. I represent the plaintiff below, Joyce Catlett. I have been practicing law in this court for 40 years. I thought I had seen it all. This is perhaps the most unusual position uh, taken by defense. Well, and it's, it is an unusual position, but, but who, who was the author of this proposal for settlement? The Florida Supreme Court has a form. It's in Rule 1.442. It was followed to the letter in this case. It does not require... But the rule also requires that any essential terms be specified in the offer. This was a very if simple this, offer me, for... Me, let me ask you this. If this, as you contend, was an offer for a unilateral contract, what had to be done to accept the offer? Tender the check. Performance. Well, where does it say that? It doesn't does say, it say that. that. It, says it says that in... It sa upon acceptance. It says that in the law this. of contracts, Your Honor. Let me go back to my first year in law school for well, you. Okay, well, okay, let me go back to your answer then. Because if you have to tender the check in order to accept it, right? That's how then you accept the unilateral contract. you don't have a settlement agreement contract. here. So how can you come in and ask to enforce it? Because they never tendered a check. So you don't have an agreement. But yet you say you have an agreement. Because there was a proposal for settlement which tracked the letter of Form 1.442. Okay, there's a proposal for settlement that you have argued is a unilateral contract, an offer to make a, un it's a unilateral contract. It's real and, simple. And it, which has to be accepted by performance. For what performance has to be tendered in order to accept this offer? The offer was for, let's settle no, this case. Please answer that question. I, I'm trying to answer it, Your Honor. The offer was for $200,000, I'll dismiss the case. I promised to dismiss the okay, case for $200,000. So your, your answer then is you have to tender $200,000 to accept this offer. But they haven't done that, so why do we have a settlement agreement? Because they filed a piece of paper which said, I accept your proposal but for settlement. But, but, a, but performance that doesn't conform to the offer is not acceptance, right? It has to be mirror image. We got the mirror image rule, right? It was possible that defense counsel thought this was an offer for a bilateral contract, not a unilateral contract, which he could accept not by performance, which you must do to accept a unilateral contract, but by a mere promise, which you do A when promise you to perform, and they made the promise to perform and accept it. Okay. Okay, Either so then way, you have a settlement agreement. 
Either they accepted way. it. Either but there's no specified time for performance. So doesn't the law imply a reasonable time? Not 10 days, a reasonable time. A, does a judge get to come in and say 10 days? How, how, where does that, where's the authority for that? The authority, there is absolutely no authority for the position that the defense no, has taken the in this case. The trial court gets to, to impose a 10 day window to, to perform under this contract. Because section 768.79 sub four says that a trial court has continuing jurisdiction to enforce the acceptance of a proposal for settlement. And it doesn't matter whether you view this as a unilateral contract. I don't think anyone's questioned that the court has authority to enforce the settlement. Well, they did. They, they have it here, but they did in their briefs. I mean, when you went in, when you went in to the trial court and asked the court to enforce it, what you asked was to require dismissal. I no. mean, excuse me, to require tender before you dismiss. They agreed to pay us in exchange for a dismissal. No, they, you, your offer said we will dismiss if you accept it. And they did. No, they didn't, Your Honor. Okay, well then you don't have a settlement agreement. They uh, you didn't know, you, if you don't have, all, I'm sorry, you gave us a lesson on fundamentals of contract law. And as I recall, you have to have an offer and an acceptance in order to, for there to be a contract. Correct. Is, is that, am I missing if, that? If this were properly viewed as an offer for an invitation for a unilateral contract, which is what it is, according to this right. court's recent decision in how? Villarreal versus Harris, then to accept an offer for a unilateral contract requires performance, requires an act, not a promise. Well, in, 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 in the case you just mentioned, the issue there was enforcement of the settlement, and I believe that your position in that case was there is no settlement agreement because it requires acceptance by performance, and they didn't perform exactly as the agreement required, so there's no agreement. There's right. no settlement. You can't enforce it, right? But here you're saying, well, they didn't do what they were supposed to do to accept it, they but it, we still have an agreement. So they, I am understandably, I think, confused. They didn't accept it in the manner that the law of contracts required. They accepted it with a promise to pay rather than payment. They converted. So you, don't have, so you don't have a contract. You don't have a settlement. That's not true, Your Honor. They converted okay. what amounted to a unilateral contract into a bilateral contract. Either way, it is a contract. Okay. They promised to pay $200,000. They have agreed to pay $200,000. Right. That is a contract. They got their dismissal. We didn't get our $200,000. Well, what? it hasn't been dismissed yet, right? Oh, it's been dismissed. Yes, Your Honor, it's been dismissed with prejudice. Okay, so the argument then is there's just this 10-day ten, ten window. The, the 10 days is a red herring. They, okay. They agreed to pay us $200,000. I don't think they're disputing that they agreed to pay $200,000. Most reasonable people would say that what is happening here is absolutely theater of the absurd. You can't agree to pay somebody $200,000 and then not pay them $200,000 but get the benefit of the bargain that you were offered and not comply with what you promised I, I to give them in exchange. I, don't, I haven't heard the argument and I, that we don't ever have to pay. You want to know what's really happening here? Let, let me tell you what's really happening. This young man who is a defendant does not have $200,000. He can't settle this case. His insurance company, which has less coverage, I would imagine, although it's not in the record, than $200,000 has come up with a little game. And the game is this. This guy lives in Hong Kong or California, according to the record. He doesn't have 200,000 bucks. We have a proposal for settlement here, which we can limit his liability and our liability in a subsequent bad faith suit by saying, okay, we'll give you $200,000, but then we won't give it to you. What we'll give you is a promise to pay you $200,000, which we will then breach. Well, it seems and to you me have that to sue us for breach well, of contract if you can find 
this defendant in California or Hong Kong, which you won't be able to, but even if you can find him, all you're going to get is a judgment that's uncollectible, and then you're going to add in GEICO, and we're going to say we've got a 10 policy, limit our liability to 10 under the non-joinder statute, and that's all this plaintiff is ever going to get is $10,000 out of his policy. If I, if I may, Mr. Eaton, because all that I know was brought before the trial court. Could you speak and, up a little yeah, bit, I said, I understand that all that was brought before the trial court. But the issue for us right now, I think this mic is coming in and out. The issue right now, because we do have, no one disputes that there's an agreement. And because that's a non-issue, the question that I want you to focus on they're taking the position that the trial judge erroneously set a 10-day period of time for payment. They're taking the position that that was wrong, that that is reversible error for the court to pick 10 days as opposed to simply saying that you have a reasonable amount of time to pay. I want you just to address that for me. To be frank, Your Honor, I think that's a throwaway issue. Their principal position is that the judge erred in ordering them to comply with their promise to pay no, the no, $200,000. No, no, they're not taking that position, Mr. Ian. They, as I hear counsel and in their briefs, and that's why we want to make sure that I understood her argument, they are not taking issue with that. Their main issue is the fact that the trial judge used that 10-day period in his order. That's the part that they have a problem with, and that's the part that they're saying that that was error on the trial court's but part. I don't care if it's 15 days or 20 days. Somehow, the court has got jurisdiction to enforce this settlement yeah. agreement. Now, nobody complained about the 10 days below. That was something that was stuck in the brief uh, on appeal. Um, we're trying to get so the they did not object. Thousand. They did not object to the 10-day period below, Mr. Eaton. I don't believe so, but I can't oh. remember everything that's in every I just record. Don't I, I just don't recall. I mean, I thought if years. you knew, maybe you could direct me to that. Okay. There is something peculiar going on here. You can't agree to settle a case and then not settle it. It's not settled until they pay the 200000 well, bucks. okay. That's a statement I can agree with, I, but everyone says it's settled. I mean, you just said it's not settled. Well, but you're, it's as not, I understand everyone's position is, well, it is in fact settled. settled. They accepted a proposal for settlement. They said, I'll settle this case for $200,000. Right. And you said, we'll dismiss it if you accept it. And they accepted it. And, and you know, Mr. But they Eno didn't pay the $200,000. Okay, so then you don't have a settlement. That's I not mean, the, that's that's not the result they want. You know, I, I, I they appreciate don't. that I'm being you know, single-minded here, yeah. but I have a really difficult time understanding how you can say they have to pay to settle. She's they haven't paid, but you insist that there's a settlement. She stood right here, Ms. DeFiore, and said, oh, they can sue us for breach of contract and garnish the wages and get a judgment and all that stuff. No, that's, I've heard it. That's not a settlement. That doesn't get rid of the underlying lawsuit. That just is a piece of paper that is absolutely well, worthless to this like plaintiff. To me when they came in and, and, and asked to have the court enforce the settlement by requiring you to dismiss it, you should have said there is no settlement. They have, we don't have any money. We they haven't paid. There's no settlement. How could we take that position when the defendant says, I accepted the settlement? Well, we're going in a circle here. And I'm you're going to, go if, if you approve that position that has been argued to this court, that you can settle it with a worthless promise. No, 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 no. Stop. And get your dismissal. No, st I, that's not my position. My position is I don't think you have a settlement, but your position is there is a settlement. We just want it enforced. I suppose we could have taken the position that there was so no don't, settlement. Don't, you know, don't tell me but because that's not, that's not how I see it. We didn't because, and I go back to my first year in law school, a unilateral offer to in, enter into a unilateral contract 
invites acceptance by performance. A Correct. bilateral contract Correct. invites acceptance by promise. Correct. We didn't get performance in the form of uh, acceptance in the form of a performance, but we got acceptance in the form of a promise. Right, but you know, you're, I know you're very familiar with the argument because you've made it, and I happen to have been on the case, that the, that the acceptance by performance has to meet the exact terms of the offer. And if it doesn't, you don't have offer and acceptance. You don't have a valid settlement agreement that's enforceable. They stand right here and tell you, yes, we promise to perform. It's a bilateral right. contract, which the okay. trial court could enforce okay. either way. Okay, they did. Then, but you... Okay, I'm sorry. They're saying we got to go I'm, out. I'm, I'm having, I feel like your argument is, you're making two different arguments, both of which leave me feeling like there's no settlement agreement here. But if, if I may. I know that the parties say there is. So if, I, if, if, I may, if, if I may, if I may, let me interject. Uh, because both sides, it's a non-issue that there was a settlement, that there is a settlement. And the court in this case went ahead and dismissed this case with prejudice and then reserved jurisdiction to enforce the agreement. So I go back to the question because that's their issue on appeal. They're taking the position, Mr. Eaton, that w where it was error for the court to impose a 10 day period of time to pay the amount. That's the whole basis of this appeal. Period. What, what's a reasonable period of time for a government employees insurance company to write a check and send it to the plaintiff? What's unreasonable about 10 days? And then I need to go back to the record just to see you're taking the position they didn't object to that below, that they're raising it for the first time on appeal. I think it's a throwaway red herring. I think they don't want to pay this judgment. She stood right here and said they got to sue us for breach of contract. It, you have to enforce this settlement agreement in another lawsuit. You can't enforce it in I this lawsuit. I think you also said that you could come in in, the, in this action and ask the court to enforce and, it. But the court did that. Jurisdiction. But didn't the court do that in this case? Because I'm looking at the order and the court basically considered the dismissal and then, it, as I read the order, that you, you filed, that, that you filed a motion to enforce the settlement and the court granted, the court basically gave you both what you wanted, dismissed the case for her granted your motion to enforce, and in granting the motion to enforce, injected that 10-day period. And that's what this whole fight on appeal is about, is this 10-day period of time. That that's I don't came out of nowhere. What you recited about the fact that the court gave both sides what the settlement agreement required by enforcing the settlement agreement as well as dismissing the lawsuit is correct. I still. I, I still take issue with the 10-day period is what this appeal that's is all about. That's what they're taking. They the don't intend to pay this judgment or we wouldn't be standing here arguing to this court. They want to make us sue this Chinese fella for $200,000 uh, if we can find him. And even if we find him, all we're going to get is a worthless piece of paper. This is a game played by a large insurance company which thinks it can get around Rule 1.442. And frankly, I'm embarrassed to stand here and be arguing that, that a member of the Florida Bar could do something like this. This is simple, straightforward. I propose a settlement. For $200,000, I'll dismiss the case. Two terms. Every reasonable human being would understand that arrangement to be Send me the check and you'll get your dismissal. Well, I think you're absolutely right about that. And I think what makes this bizarre is the fact that you're insisting that in the absence of them tendering the check, you still have a settlement. I have a settlement because they promised to pay rather than tendering the payment. Well, you've taken the position that it's a unilateral contract. No, I said it makes no difference whether it's unilateral or bilateral. The trial judge could enforce it either way. Uh, I have no idea how much time I've used because I haven't been paying have attention. I've been minutes. getting so many hard <laughs> questions <laughs> You here. still have about four minutes if you want them. <laughs> I'll, I'll try not to use all four of them. That's all right. Another thing that's happened here is that this order enforcing this settlement agreement was entered on August 7, 2013. 
And because it was immediately appealed and stayed within a day after the motion, I didn't get a chance to respond to it, we've been deprived of what amounts to essentially post-judgment interest. I would request the court, if, if it affirms what the trial judge did below in enforcing this agreement, uh, to have I indicate on remand that we're entitled to interest on that $200,000 from the date of the enforcement order, August 7, uh, 2013. Um, but if, I, if I'm looking at the case right now, Mr. Ian, there was no, there's no pending motions before us. That, that, that your request was not made when the brief was filed, correct? I'm sorry, I still can't hear you. Oh, I'm, I'm getting sorry. a little long in the tooth you're, here. I think it's this microphone. What, you're making a request right now that you want to have interest, but I'm asking you, did you file a motion here with the court on the appellate, the appellate no, court? No, it, it, it was requested in the conclusion to my appellee's brief, Your Honor, All right. that an appropriate disposition would be an affirmance with a remand to add interest to the uh, 200000 not a motion for attorney's fees or anything like that, no. It was made as a request in the Appley's brief. No, I understand that. Uh, I, I, I still stand before you dumbfounded um, that, that, that this case seems more complicated to you than it seems to me. Thank you. If it's so dumbfounding that the defendant wonders about whether or not payment is implied, though I have not argued that here, and then I am kind of dumbfounded when a proposal for settlement is waved around a bad faith case and the insurance companies are accused of being in more bad faith because proposals for settlement are filed and payment is not an obligation and yet the insurance company failed to well, save well, their insurance. Let's, let's put all that aside. Mr. Fr I want to get back to the, your position. Your position throughout has been, you're taking issue with the 10-day period. It's a little bit bigger court. than that, and I've tried to say that a couple of times. There was no basis to enter an order compelling or enforcing this agreement. It's well, premature at this point. Well, I mean, I think that's part of your position, but aren't you also arguing that an order enforcing a settlement agreement has to enforce the terms of the settlement agreement? And there was no, sp there was no 10-day provision as a part of the settlement agreement. Yeah. The settlement agreement left that open. Exactly. In, in the time period in which. So in order for the court to enforce the agreement, it has, it's enforcing the terms of the agreement, but that wasn't a term. It, exactly. So why isn't 10 days a reasonable time? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be your argument? Because I think you've agreed well, that, and again, that I, they I, have to pay within a reasonable time. And if the court decides 10 days is reasonable, well, and again, I think that amount, a reasonable amount of time probably requires an evidentiary hearing in this case because we're dealing with an individual oh, and he needs make, to explain that. Okay, well, did you comment make that argument below? Uh, he, Mr. Mr. Hosbury repeatedly asked the court not to do any kind of compelling of payment, whether it was 10 no. days, whether it was 20 days, whatever it was, because we don't know what Mr. C is going to do when the court enforced the plaintiff's end of the bargain. And it wasn't like the court enforced it and dismissed the case, and then a few days later we came back. This, these were heard at the exact same hearing, and there'd been no opportunity for Mr. C to respond to the court's order of dismissal before the plaintiff was out here asking for, for mandatory payment terms and all kinds of things like that. Let, let's clarify that. I thought both parties filed motions with the court, one of them compelling dismissal of the case, right. and Mr. Ian filed a motion to compel the enforcement. So the judge heard of both at the same hearing. At the same hearing. And at the same hearing, he said, yep, there's an agreement, and you all agreed, everybody, both parties agreed that there's an agreement, and that's when he decided to dismiss this case with prejudice. Then he dealt with this, and you know, when can we enforce the, 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 the agreement? And that's where these, there was discussion back and forth, and at one point the judge was saying, well, this is, you know, punitive, I'm gonna enforce certain sanctions, but thank God he did not do that. And what he ended up doing, c coming out with this payment within 10 days. And again, I well, don't think there was authority to move beyond the dismissal at that point. Is, is <coughs> I'm trying to put this in terms that I can get my brain around. Is your argument on this then that because of the timing at this hearing, that what really needed to happen is the court 
there had been no opportunity for your client to perform. Exactly. Okay, because yep. the dismissal hadn't been entered, and the dismissal was entered as a result of this hearing, and your contention is there should have been some opportunity for your client to perform before the court entered the order. And yep. if your client failed to perform within a reasonable time, I guess you're suggesting that they would have to come back in, file a motion to, support, to enforce, and then if the court wanted to do 10 days, fine. Well, at, at that point, I mean, you find out what might be a reasonable be time. Accurate? What might be a reasonable time? In other words, it's... Well, it's, okay, it's, yeah, 10, 15, you, you, then you wouldn't be complaining about the 10 days or whatever. I mean, you might be arguing it's not reasonable, but you wouldn't be arguing the court didn't have authority at some point to impose a time limit on when it, this performance had to occur. I, I think that the court had the authority to enter in order to enforce the, the settlement agreement, however that was, whether it was payment in, ten, in however, a reasonable amount of time, it was entry of a judgment, right, it was but your problem, whatever the your, enforcement Your problem was. Is, is, is the timing of the court entering this order before your client failed to perform? Is, yes. is that what you're saying? Yes, and then by Not doing the so, by adding. doesn't have the authority to do what it did, just the timing was wrong. Right, and, and we may have questioned the court, whether the court retained jurisdiction on the proposal for settlement after the dismissal, but I think this court has very clearly well, addressed that, so we are not well, no, saying that. Well, no, I thought that, you so. said that the court retained we, jurisdiction. It, well, the court it. did, and there was some question whether the court had authority. Mr. Brennan said to the judge, if you dismiss it before payment, you don't have authority to enforce this. And in our initial brief, we questioned whether there was authority after the dismissal. But again, this court has clearly said that you do have the enforcement power is there even after a dismissal. So we're not arguing that the court did not have jurisdiction to enforce the Agree compliance no. with the settlement agreement. No, and, I, and I'm glad yes. you said because so. that's a non-issue. Yes, because the it's court, a non-issue. Because <laughs> the court by themselves. Wasted said pages. Well, we <laughs> <laughs> so. well okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you both.